separating triplets. In the 1960s and 1970s, clinical psychologists led by Peter Newbar ran a secret experiment, in which they separated twins and triplets from each other and adopted them out as singlets. The experiment, said to have been partly funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, came to light when three identical triplet brothers accidentally found each other in 1980. They had no idea they had siblings. David Kelman, one of the triplets, felt anger towards the experiment. We were robbed of 20 years together, said Kelman in the Orlando Sentinel article. His brother, Edward Galland, died by suicide in 1995 at his home in Maplewood, New Jersey. The child psychiatrists who headed up the study, Peter Newbar and Viola Bernard, showed no remorse. According to news reports, going as far as saying they thought they were doing something good for the kids, separating them so they could develop their individual personalities, said Bernard. As for what Newbar learned from his secret evil experiment, that's anyone's guess, as the results of the controversial study are being stored in an archive at Yale University, and they can't be unsealed until 2066. Newbar published some of his findings in a 1996 book, Nature's Thumbprint, The New Genetics of Personality, primarily concerning his son. According to Psychology Today, some of Dr. Viola Bernard's papers have become viewable at Columbia University. Director Tim Wardle chronicled the lives of the triplets in the film Three Identical Strangers, which debuted at Sundance 2018. Electroshock Therapy on Children In the 1960s, Dr. Loretta Bender of New York's Credmore Hospital began what she believed to be a revolutionary treatment for children with social issues, electroshock therapy. Bender's methods included interviewing and analyzing a sensitive child in front of a large group, then applying a gentle amount of pressure to the child's head. Supposedly, any child who moved with the pressure was showing early signs of schizophrenia. Herself the victim of a misunderstood childhood, Bender was said to be unsympathetic to the children in her care. By the time her treatments were shut down, Bender had used electroshock therapy on over 100 children, the youngest of whom was age 3. Hepatitis in Mentally Disabled Children in the 1950s, Willowbrook State School, a New York state-run institution for mentally handicapped children, began experiencing outbreaks of hepatitis. Due to unsanitary conditions, it was virtually inevitable that these children would contract hepatitis. Dr. Saul Krugman, sent to investigate the outbreak, proposed an experiment that would assist in developing a vaccine. However, the experiment required intentionally infecting children with the disease. Though Krugman's study was controversial from the start, critics were eventually silenced by the permission letters obtained from each child's parents. In reality, offering one's child to the experiment was oftentimes the only way to guarantee admittance into the overcrowded institution. The Monster Study Pioneering speech pathologist Wendell Johnson suffered from severe stuttering that began early in his childhood. His own experience motivated his focus on finding the cause, and hopefully a cure, for stuttering. He theorized that stuttering in children could be impacted by external factors, such as negative reinforcement. Under Johnson's supervision, graduate student Mary Tudor conducted a stuttering experiment using 22 children at an Iowa orphanage. Half of them received positive reinforcement, but the other half were ridiculed and criticized for their speech, whether or not they actually stuttered. This resulted in a worsening of speech issues for the children who were given negative feedback. The study was never published due to the multitude of ethical violations. According to the Washington Post, Tudor was remorseful about the damage caused by the experiment and returned to the orphanage to help the children with their speech. Despite his ethical mistakes, the Wendell Johnson Speech and Hearing Clinic at the University of Iowa bears Johnson's name and is a nod to his contributions to the field. Infected Mosquitoes in Towns In 1956 and 1957, the United States Army conducted a number of biological warfare experiments on the cities of Savannah, Georgia and Avon Park, Florida. 
In one such experiment, millions of infected mosquitoes were released into the two cities in order to see if the insects could spread yellow fever and dengue fever. Not surprisingly, hundreds of researchers contracted illnesses that included fevers, respiratory problems, stillbirths, encephalitis, and typhoid. In order to photograph the results of their experiment, army researchers pretended to be public health workers. Several people died as a result of the research. Unit 731 from 1937 to 1945, the Imperial Japanese Army developed a covert biological and chemical warfare research experiment called Unit 731. Based in the large city of Harbin, Unit 731 was responsible for some of the most atrocious war crimes in history. Chinese and Russian subjects, men, women, children, infants, the elderly, and pregnant women, were subjected to experiments which included the removal of organs from a live body amputation for the study of blood loss, germ warfare attacks, and weapons testing. Some prisoners even had their stomachs surgically removed and their esophagus reattached to their intestines. Many of the scientists involved rose to prominent careers in politics, academia, business, and medicine. Project MK Ultra. The infamous project MKUltra was CIA's attempt at mastering mind control. The program started in the 1950s and lasted seemingly until 1966. Under MKUltra, often unwilling subjects were given drugs, especially hallucinogenics like LSD. The people tested were also put through sleep and sensory deprivation, hypnosis, sexual abuse, and other kinds of psychological torture, while some tests proved lethal. The supposed goal of the project was some combination of chemical weapons research and effort to create mind-controlling drugs to combat the Soviets. Agent Orange Experiments Prisoners, like people of color, have often been the unwilling objects of evil experiments. From 1965 to 1966, Dr. Albert Kligman, funded by Dow Chemical, Johnson & Johnson, and the U.S. Army, conducted what was deemed dermatological research on approximately 75 prisoners. What was actually being studied was the effect of Agent Orange on humans. Prisoners were injected with dioxin, a toxic byproduct of Agent Orange, 468 times the amount the study originally called for. The results were prisoners with volcanic eruptions of chloracne, severe acne combined with blackheads, cysts, pustules, and other really bad stuff on the face, armpits, and groin. Long after the experiments ended, prisoners continued to suffer from the effects of the exposure. Dr. Kligman, apparently very enthusiastic about the study, was quoted as saying, All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. Kligman went on to become the doctor behind Retin A, a major treatment for acne. Irradiation of Black Cancer Patients From 1960 until 1971, Dr. Eugene Sanger, a radiologist at the University of Cincinnati, led an experiment posing 88 cancer patients, poor and mostly black, to whole body radiation. Even though this sort of treatment had already been pretty well discredited for the types of cancer these patients had. They were not asked to sign consent forms, nor were they told the Pentagon funded the study. They were simply told they would be getting a treatment that might help them. Patients were exposed, in the period of one hour, to the equivalent of about 20,000 x-rays worth of radiation. Nausea, vomiting, severe stomach pain, loss of appetite, and mental confusion were the results. A report in 1972 indicated that as many as a quarter of the patients died of radiation poisoning. The Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment From 1932 to 1972, the U.S. Public Health Service, working with the Tuskegee Institute, conducted research on untreated syphilis. In the study, 399 poor farmers from Alabama, two-thirds of whom were diagnosed with syphilis, were tracked over years. In 1940, we already knew that syphilis can be easily cured with penicillin. The doctors wanted to see how the disease would develop without the use of modern pharmacology. 
Complimentary doctor's visits, which the farmers would not normally be able to afford, were offered to get them to donate blood. A warm meal was provided after each examination as bait. Since all the farmers were black and all the doctors were white, the study was not only unethical but also deeply racist. 28 of the 399 infected persons died of the disease. 100 more died of indirect complications of syphilis. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.